Fern Hobart, who is one of the best uh, finance and tech journalists uh, alive and writing today. Bern has a background on Wall Street and is currently the author of the newsletter, The Diff, uh, which you can subscribe to at thediff.co. I and many other Manifold uh, team members are subscribed, and I heartily recommend you do the same. So without any further ado, here's uh, Bern Hobart talking about prediction markets and finance. All right. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, two quick clarifications. Um, I do not identify as a journalist, although I do write for a living. And also, um, the shirt, it, I am not a Fed. I don't work for the Federal Reserve. I just thought the shirt would be funny. Um, but with that out of the way, so let's talk about what, what can prediction markets learn from financial markets. And you know, per the meme, I want to make money predicting the outcomes of geopolitical events, but we have a way you can make money predicting the outcomes of geopolitical events at home. So let's, let's do a, a quick case study on how prediction markets can help us see the future and know what will happen. So this is, of course, a chart of a um, prediction market betting on the odds that Russia will invade Ukraine. Obviously, those odds start out low in January of 2020. They rise up as different events take shape and then eventually hit 100% at the end. But just kidding, that's actually a chart of Brent crude oil futures, which also were kind of lowish in January of 2020, rose in response to increasing tensions on the Russia-Ukraine border, and then just ripped when the actual invasion happened. Um, it is worth noting that they subsequently went down. But they were, like, if you were looking at the news, you see these headlines, but you also see headlines all the time, like the journalists covering Russia and Ukraine wants it to be a big deal that something is happening in Russia or something's happening in Ukraine. So of course, they're going to say things that cause you to freak out. If these, these countries haven't been in the news that much in the recent past, you may not have some idea of the base rate, like how much tension is normal tension, how much tension is the war's about to start tension. And you know, there was this lively debate, literally up until the tanks start, well, up until Putin started talking and the tanks started rolling, of is this really a military exercise? Like, why would they do this? Are the Ukrainians acting like they think there's going to be a war, et cetera? So there was a debate, and um, the, the prediction market embodied in crude oil futures was one, one way that you could say that people with actual money on the line were taking this pretty seriously. They were reacting to changes in the state of affairs, and they, they um, were basically predicting that an invasion would happen and then reacting when it actually did. And there are plenty of other case studies like that. So you can look at things like the British pound reacting to Brexit. Um, you can look at the stock market reacting to Donald Trump in 2016. You can look at the stock market reacting to um, Biden winning in 2020. So like, we can use these external markets as a source of information about what's going on in the world. And in particular, as a source of information on what, how important is this thing that we know happened according to people who have money on the line. So let's, um, like, that, that's sort of how they work. Like they, they're all discounting views on the future. So you buy oil futures when you think that oil is going to be relatively harder to get in the future. You buy bonds when you think that interest rates are going down. You buy stocks when you think growth is going up. And not only do we have these, but we have this rich ecosystem of prop bets through derivatives. So you can make these really interesting bets that are quasi-conditional, like I think if Brent crude goes, hit, if it hits 90, it's definitely going to 100. So you write a call option at 90, you buy two call options at 100, and you have made a bet basically on the conditional probability of these price changes. And the price of options actually reflects people's views on the conditional probabilities. So if you look at the price of buying put options on the S&P 500, you will see what's called, um, it used to be called the volatility smile. So this symmetric thing where um, the, essentially, so taking a step back, um, the the classic way to price options is this Black-Scholes formula where you have some obvious inputs like, um, is it a put or a call? What's the price of the asset? What's the current interest rate? What is the strike price of the option? And then you have this wonderful input of volatility. So the higher volatility goes, the more valuable it is to make a bet on some extreme event. And so you can actually run Black-Scholes in reverse and say, given this options price and given this, this um, price of the stock or whatever asset, what is the implied volatility? And so that's when people draw the, the smile, that's what they're drawing. But it used to be a smile, now it's a smirk. Now the conditional probability of extreme losses is higher than the conditional probability of extreme gains because markets, markets don't um, jump 20% overnight usually, but they do sometimes crash 20% overnight. So people know that there is like conditional on things going bad, things can get worse. 
Another cool thing about markets, um, I think like there's, it's not coincidental that there is this overlap between rationalists and gamblers and prop traders, um, is that they're, they, they encourage you to do a lot of just epistemically healthy things. So if you have a view on the market, you want to calibrate your confidence. You want to talk to people who agree with you and try to figure out, do these people sound smart or am I a smart person agreeing with dumb people? You want to talk to the smartest person who disagrees with you because they will probably have thought of things you haven't thought of. And what you really want is you want to be betting against someone knowing that you know why they think they're right and you know why that view is wrong. So you're steel manning the opposition. You, you make more money when you understand who you're betting against and why they are stupid. You also, it also forces you to continuously just reconsider your cached thoughts, reconsider the, the underlying premises. So there was this, this long period where people looked at Microsoft as this company that used to be great, that still prints money because people keep renewing their office subscriptions, but it's never gonna do anything amazing. And then Microsoft started doing amazing things and the stock went massively, massively higher. And um, so there were, there were a lot of people who got totally blindsided by this not because they didn't respect Microsoft or think it was a great company, like had been a great company, they just didn't realize, they didn't update that it was continuing to get better. So these are all really good habits. Um, having money on the line forces you to do all of these generally mentally healthy things about your predictions about reality. So in that sense, existing asset markets are really, really good as a way to make bets about the future and to see what the median view of the future is. So let's talk about some ways that they're bad. So I have um, carefully mocked up a view of, okay, all these epistemically healthy people who are honing their views on reality. Well, sometimes their view on reality changes faster than it is possible for reality to change. Um, you can read through the whole thing if you want. Um, it's not that good, but it will get posted online somewhere, I'm sure. Anyway, like we have, we have crashes. Markets do crazy things that do not actually make sense from an efficient markets perspective and that don't even make sense from a, you know, the market learned something that it didn't know yesterday and therefore the discounted, the present value of discounted future cash flows has suddenly changed. Sometimes something else is going on. Um, sometimes many other things are going on. So. What are those many other things? Why don't these markets always work the way they should work if we're trying to use them as a replacement for wonderful services like Manifold and other sponsors of this event? <laughs> Here's why they are bad. So one, there is just noise. There's random noise. People trade for all kinds of random reasons, but um, that's, that's pretty much obvious. Like anyone who talks about efficient markets will immediately get some back talk about how markets aren't efficient, some people are dumb, some prices don't make sense, what about the dot-coms, what about SPACs, what about GameStop, et cetera. So there is noise, there is stuff that doesn't fit into any model because if it fit into a model, the model would be perfect and then whoever had the model would make all the money, they'd set all the prices and then either it's like the end of the world and we know the entirety of the future of the human species or the model is somehow wrong and the person running it blows up. One of those has to be true. Another one is uh, reflexivity. So um, markets reflect reality. Markets affect reality. When Russia was making noises about invading Ukraine, people had this idea of the calculus of Putin, which is he, has, he does put some value on conquering slash reconquering, in his view, parts of Ukraine. Um, but he also has this cost, which is there are going to be sanctions. The sanctions will make it hard for Russia to sell oil. Russia needs to sell oil for its economy to function. That's bad. But the higher oil prices go, the harder it is to impose sanctions and the less likely they are to be enforced. So by making scary noises about invading Ukraine, Russia causes the price of oil to go up. That actually reduces the odds of sanctions hitting and reduces the expected effectiveness of them. And also means that if the sanctions whack $10 off of the price of a barrel of oil, if oil's gone up $30, you actually come out with a profit from invading Ukraine. <laughs> Not endorsing, just explaining. <laughs> so what that means, though, is that sometimes your market is telling you something about the state of the world, but it's changing the state of the world in a way that causes that state of the world to change again, such that the market has to keep going in the direction it's been going. Um, the reason George Soros can um, donate so much money to so many interesting causes is that he understood this very well and used this again and again. A related point is that leverage in the system does cause weird nonlinear movements. And in fact, um, Soros's original piece on reflexivity talked a lot about leverage. He talks about how if you have companies that borrow money to make investments and they're basically making a spread between here's how much they pay to borrow, here's how much they make when they lend, as their stock price goes up, lenders look at that stock price and say, this company is actually a better credit. We can lend them, we can, uh, lend them more money at lower terms because they can always just issue some stock to pay back the loans if they need to. That causes those companies to borrow more money, lend more money. Suddenly, whatever they're lending to, it gets really crowded. The, the marginal loan they make as the market gets hotter is a dumber and dumber loan to make. 
and suddenly people start to realize these loans are not getting paid back. But then there's this weird period where the loans are getting paid back because more loans are being made. So people are doing structurally unprofitable things, but continuing to borrow more money to fund them. So if you think of U.S. housing in 2004 to 2006, there was this crazy loop. There's a cool Clarium Capital research paper from like the Teal, the Teal people about this years ago, where when oil prices went up, it makes Americans poorer, but it makes Saudi Arabia richer. Saudi Arabia invests that money in subprime mortgage-backed structured products that causes more demand for housing, especially subprime housing. Housing prices go up, so people who have less money in their pockets because gas prices are higher and they're living paycheck to paycheck, they realize they can refinance their home, take an even bigger mortgage, and actually spend more money. So somehow, the thing that made America fundamentally poorer made the average subprime borrower richer in terms of how much money they can spend. And subprime borrowers t do tend to, um, they tend to spend the money that you lend them. So um, for a while, there was this kind of broken relationship. And that, as we all hopefully know, got really, really broken in 2008. And things, things went kind of crazy. So you have, you have these feedback loops that make prices this confusing guide to the future. Um, it's, it's kind of like time travel paradoxes where if you change something and the, you change something and it causes something to change that changes the way you could change the thing. Um, but it also, all, what, it, what also happens with prices, and these are all elements of this same fact, is that prices, it's this one dimensional thing. It's, it's a scalar, right? It's a number. But, it's a number that's a mix of a bunch of different things. So when you make a prediction about prices, you have to be um, ideal, like some mix of three things. Your prediction has to be right. So if you are wrong, you will probably lose money. Your prediction has to be important. So if you're right about something that does not matter, you will not necessarily make money, you will probably lose money. And your prediction has to be out of consensus. So if you are right about something everyone agrees on, you don't make much money. Um, you know, in like, NVIDIA will sell a lot of GPUs because people really want to train lots of um, AI models. That is true. It's accurate. It's a very important thing. It could be the most important thing ever. But it's also very much in consensus. No one is very surprised to hear that. And you can't infer the mix of how much of your correct view was the accuracy, how much was the importance, how much was the out of consensus. You can't infer that purely from prices. So really, what we're looking at with prices is we're looking at this one-dimensional projection of this n-dimensional, very complicated thing, and the number of salient dimensions is actually changing over time. Everyone has a different idea of how many dimensions there are. There are. Um, the, the discretionary traders, so the people who are saying, buy this stock, my price target is based on a multiple of free cash flow, they, they are not thinking about n-dimensional spaces and things, but implicitly that's what they're doing. They're interacting with this multi-dimensional space, but they're putting it into one dimension. And of course, if you compress a lot of numbers, into one number, you, you lose something in that compression and you can't decompress it. At least you, I mean, you could sort of try, but you generally can't decompress it. So they are, they reflect sometimes predictions about the world, but in this very imperfect and hard to measure way. So let's, let's flip this around. Why, why are prediction markets bad financial markets? So we have noise. Yes, once again, we have noise. People like to bet on prediction markets for many reasons that do not have to do with maximizing their expected value. They're not doing Kelly bets. Sometimes they just really wanted Yang to win, and so they put a lot of money on Yang. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would have been cool if it had happened, but it didn't. So people, people trade for a lot of reasons. Um, now I'm dialing back to, to financial markets. Like There are lots of reasons people participate in traditional financial markets. And the one that I've mostly talked about is they're expressing some definite view about the future. But another reason they do it is they are hedging a different trade. So someone might be buying NVIDIA because they think that NVIDIA is going to grow even faster than people expected. But they might also be buying NVIDIA because they have shorted, uh, they've shorted Google for whatever reason, and they want to hedge their risk that just tech stocks in general do well. So they short NVIDIA and five other big tech companies. And so that's why they're selling NVIDIA. So that, that, in, that trade has very little information content for your question about NVIDIA. It just has information content in terms of what, what specific trade are they trying to express. But since you don't know what trade they're doing, you don't actually know what view it's expressing. And then there are also people who are hedging, um, hedging just a, a risk for their business. So a lot of the people participating in those oil markets 
were um, they were people like airlines or oil refineries or um, chemicals companies that use oil as a feedstock. Like they are just buying oil futures because they don't want to think about the price of oil and they don't react that much to where the price of oil is. They just want to be able to have a very simple model of we use X barrels of oil, they cost Y dollars, and we want to be able to say at the end of the year, this is how much money we'll make. So they, again, they're not giving you very much information on the market. And you also have people who participate in traditional asset markets because they are doing diversified bets to collect risk premia. So every financial asset, it has some expected return from just the real rate of return you get from putting your money to work somewhere. And then it has some, some additional rate of return that is basically compensation for taking a risk. And um, the, the actual ratio between the risk and reward, um, it's pretty consistent across different asset classes. So if you bought bonds like 40 years ago and just used enough leverage that your bond portfolio fluctuated as much as your stock portfolio, you would have made about as much money as you would buying stocks. So um, they, they're just collecting all these different risk premia, which correlate with slightly different things and don't perfectly correlate with one another. But that to do that trade, it ultimately gets expressed as buying specific stocks, buying a specific oil contract, buying a specific bond. But again, it doesn't tell you that someone has a strong view that this asset is going up or down. Um, it just tells you these, these people are making this trade and just allocating some money. And then people also trade in order to diversify after a successful investment. So um, if, you, um, if you joined Facebook in 2007, um, first of all, congratulations. Second, you have a lot of money and you are now running a fairly sizable investment fund that has one asset. It's a pretty volatile asset and you may know a lot about it, but you don't, probably don't know enough to know that all your money should be in shares of Meta Platforms Incorporated. So you gradually sell it. And that means you are, you are not a very informative seller. The fact that that um, you know that Bill Gates periodically sold chunks of Microsoft and that Jeff Bezos sold chunks of Amazon doesn't tell you they think the company is going to zero. It tells you they they want to own other assets or they want to you know cure diseases and build rockets and other fun stuff. And then people some people just trade to feel something like they they like gambling. It's fun, um, and so so they do it. And sometimes they they want to be apes apes together strong with diamond hands forever. <laughs> until the company finds a way to massively increase its allowable share count and the apes get destroyed. It's sad, they're, they're magnificent creatures, but they're going extinct. Um, and pr so prediction markets, they, they offer some of this, they don't offer all of this. And because they don't have so many people trading for so many different reasons, they don't offer so many opportunities for people to pick off dumb money. Um, I was actually, I, I kind of went back and forth on, do I call these people noise traders or dumb money? Um, noise traders is the academic term. Dumb money is the industry term. Um, I was a little bit worried because like you know, if you, you know, if I, if I use a screenshot of the poster for the movie Dumb Money, maybe Sony sues me. If I, if I allude to the existence of the movie Dumb Money, then Ken Griffin at Citadel might sue me. So we, we can call them either one. Just don't tell anyone I said dumb money. Um, but the, the cool thing about dumb money or noise traders whatever, is everyone is dumb money to someone else. Everybody is somebody else's noise trader. So if you are a market maker, so you make money from continuously, like you buy from willing sellers, you sell to willing buyers, you end up owning nothing at the end of the day, and you've made a little bit of a spread on those transactions, you're, the dumb money is the stock picker who doesn't realize they could pay a little bit less. They're slightly overpaying for liquidity. They just want in on the stock. Now, the, the stock picker may or may not be right over the next year, but you're out of the trade in five minutes, so you don't care. So the stock picker to you is just dumb money, unless they're doing a huge trade and you got the first piece of it and now you were betting against them and they're trading more and you, you let massively lose money, but they, they try to avoid that. Um, so the, then the stock pickers, they're also, they're trading against market makers. They're also trading against index funds. So every time people get their paycheck and they automatically allocate some of that money to a 401k and it goes into a fidelity fund that's just gonna track the S&P 500 or a Vanguard fund or whatever, um, that index fund buys a bunch of stuff and that stuff, th that buying, in part, it's an opportunity for a smart stock picker who bought it when it was cheap to sell it to someone who the index fund is not thinking about valuation. It's just mechanically buying and selling. And meanwhile, the index funds, they are the dumb money with respect to macro funds. So you can be this really clever business analyst. You spend all of your time thinking about um, I don't know, you think about oil companies and you know their relative margins, you know which CEO is savvy and which CEO is dumb and who's probably gonna do a buyback and what mergers are happening. And then the macro person realizes, hey, there's a recession coming and oil is gonna get walloped and all of the stocks are gonna get. So the macro fund trades against that. Um, so that like everyone, 
everyone can treat someone else as an uninformed trader with respect to the, the time horizon that this informed trader has and with respect to the benchmark this trader has and what, like what kinds of trades they're making. And meanwhile, all of these traders are constantly making the market more efficient. They're always pushing prices in the direction of whatever research tells them is the right thing to do. That even goes to the index funds, and they, they are essentially, um, you can view index funds as this bet that the cost of active stock selection is actually higher than the cost of adverse selection from buying everything, even when that includes GameStop. And that is that has actually historically been the right bet. Like People were making way too much money picking stocks, and they should have just thrown darts at a dart, you know, thrown darts at the page of stock quotes back when newspapers did that and just bought stuff at random. It would have gotten better results and it's much cheaper. So like there's, the market is constantly making itself more efficient and that only works if there is someone who is trading against you who you know is not going to, not going to get the maximally advantageous price by your view. So smart money, yeah, needs dumb money. Like People actually need um, people to have an incentive to trade. You need someone who has a worse incentive than you to make a simply to make the equal and opposite trade. And um, and the markets they need um, so what they need is some source of dumb money. And what the traditional asset markets have is like they have all these different kinds of investors who want to participate in all kinds of different ways. And so what prediction markets need, the way they become smart markets, is they need some form of dumb money. And so what I'm really outlining here is um, two different ways that you can get dumb money into your market. And one of them is you structure your prediction market so that it actually has a positive expected return over time and gives investors some kind of risk premium, just like the S&P 500, just like buying treasury bonds, just like anything else where you get some return because you had money and now somebody else has it. And so when you get it back, you need more of it to compensate for that. And then you have some money from you had money, you gave it to somebody else, you get back some return plus or minus something, and the plus or minus something has to be compensated for with higher returns. So the way to structure that is you have contracts that pay off at you know $1 if this thing is, is um, if yes is selected, and the price of that contract is really going to, is supposed to reflect both the cost, uh, like the, the cost of locking your money up until the market is, at, until the contract actually ends, plus the compensation for volatility. And you could presumably structure markets so that on the long side or the short side, people who passively just put money into the market and accept that they're going to be dumb money, they, they get some, some additional return just based on how the contracts are priced. So that's like, that, that is sort of a, an outline of how a real money prediction market can do it. And then there is the, the other outline of how a play money prediction market can do it, which is memes, fun, and status. So memes encourage participation. They actually encourage participation outside of the original market. Like one way to view the whole meme stock phenomenon is that the meme stocks were this, um, this way that the fairly boring business of finance could escape the containment zone and could get into the Reddit and 4chan area where there's just much more aggressive mimetic selection for um, for high rate of reproduction. So um, like there's there's this interesting way of kind of ranking different kinds of social media sites based on how how short the cycle, the life cycle of a piece of content is and what the deletion speed is. And with, with 4chan in particular, the fact that everything just gets deleted after a while unless it gets screen capped, it means that for a meme to survive in the 4chan environment, it has to be a meme people want to continuously repeat. For a meme to survive on Reddit, Every post, you know, gets upvoted, but there's also this gravitational force that gets stronger and stronger over time. You you eventually just run out of upvotes, even if you're on the Donald subreddit. You run out of upvotes, and it starts drifting down the homepage. So, you have to have some meme that people want to continuously post and continuously tweak. And then the fact that um, this happened at a, like the meme stock stuff happened at a time when people were on lockdown, they were home, and Robinhood was big, and Robinhood was marketing itself pretty aggressively ahead of its own IPO. It meant that things could escape. The the, the totally dumb fun play zone uh, with very R select very strong R selection for for memes and could actually enter the the finance zone which is like the finance zone is much more case selected for memes like you have to actually be right and you have to be right for a long time to make money so um, they there tends to be a lot of selection for memetic quality over time but if you have this extreme selection for virality 
there, there isn't really a strong immune system to that in the markets. So um, memes, memes actually entered the market and it drove the market crazy for a while. It made some people money. It cost a lot of people a lot of money. But it generally encourages participation. And so memes in a prediction market, the reason that they are powerful is not that they keep people on Manifold. It's that they get people onto Manifold. And that if, you, if Manifold is a way to incubate memes that they can, can then spread on Twitter and spread on Reddit and spread on other sites, then it brings in this continuous supply of delicious, dumb money that can be preyed upon by the sharks in the market. Um, but then there's also just the fun, the fun aspect. Um, these markets are entertaining. Um, it's like the emotional highlight of this entire conference for me was seeing the side door open, seeing the pool come in, seeing the bag of <laughs> balls for the ball pit, and being the first person <laughs> who had not seen it outside, but like the first person to, among the crowd in the park area to get out the app and start buying that contract. <laughs> it was incredible. I will, I will never forget this. I'll be thinking about it on my deathbed. Um, <laughs> and it's fun. So the fun part does encourage participation. And you could definitely imagine a scenario there where I was the dumb money, where someone had actually done this to manipulate the market, like they painted the tape, they bought the contract, they came in with the ball pit, they sold a bunch of yes, they left, I was humiliated. It could have gone that way. And this again, this actually feeds into the meme thing because this could be a meme, there could be great disappointment, it could be like those pictures of uh, you know floor traders on the New York Stock Exchange. There's, there's like this guy who his job is basically be a floor trader with a very expressive face and crazy hair. So every time the market crashes, he just poses like this and people post his, like he, he gets the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, and then you have the leaderboard and status. So um, I, I, for one, am a sucker for leaderboards. I have to be careful not to get on leader, like I have to be careful not to get to a point on leaderboards where it looks like I'm trying because then I'll actually have to try and then I'll really want to win. But leaderboards, they do create a sense of competition. They also create a sense of community. So of course, Manifold has this nice thing with leagues. So you're always competing directly with peers. You don't actually see how much smarter the actual smart people on the site are. You just see how your immediate peers are doing, and then you get these daily updates. So that, that again, makes it fun, and the fun feeds into the memes, and the memes feed into traffic and attention and branding, and that creates dumb money. And dumb money, if we are trying to have smart markets, dumb money is what we are here for. So there we go. Um, I've left some time for questions. Happy to answer questions. And as you can probably see from the slide, um, by the way, this so there was the the presentation um, on uh, on Friday from Louis. This is like the the inverse or like transposition of this. Um, it's like financial financial markets as prediction markets rather than prediction markets as a source for financial markets. So I have um, shamelessly copied sales pitch, QR code, etc. But yeah, happy to answer any questions from anybody on anything remotely related to this. Let's have a round of applause. For this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on prediction markets uh, in a legalized setting being applied to private companies um, and what implications that might have. So would this be um, like betting on the valuation of private companies or like betting on decisions within private companies? I, I'm sure there's different opera operationalizations, but I'm thinking of the valuation of private companies like Stripe or sure. you know, other large companies. So that gets hard because with public markets, we have um, SEC filings, we can see the, the capital structure of the company. And actually, capital structure can vary a lot. Um, it doesn't vary a lot in tech among public tech companies, but it varies a lot in other industries. And so, um, Typically, when investors are valuing a company that is like um, a steel company, an airline, et cetera, they're, they're looking at the full capital structure. So they would do something like an enterprise value to um, earnings before interest and taxes. So they're basically looking at what does the pure business make and what is the total value of that business? And then they strip out, OK, how much of that goes to the creditors? And then if I'm interested in the stock, what's left for me? So um, I bring that up because with private companies, they actually have messy, complicated capital structures, and um, especially right now. So pretty much your prior, anytime you hear about a company that raises money this year, and it's at exactly the value they raised at in 2021, your prior should be, it was not at the value they raised at in 2021. What they did was they sold the, a similar percentage of the company for a similar amount of money, but the terms on that agreement were things like the new investor gets a liquidation preference where if the company doesn't sell for 
like if the company sells for the amount that it was valued at, they get twice their money back before anyone else gets money back. Or um, there are these really cool deals um, where the the investor will lend, they'll structure the investment as a loan. The loan has an interest rate. The interest rate goes up every six months if the company does an IPO and it never stops. <laughs> so um, this app, I think Spotify did a deal like this with hedge funds, uh, a couple hedge funds. And um, it was like basically the terms of the deal were Go public or you have sold Spotify to a hedge fund for one-tenth of what Spotify was worth. So you, it's actually really hard to get those valuations right. Now, when, when the company goes public, typically all of that stuff converts to common stock at whatever ratio was defined by those agreements. And so at that point, you do know the valuation. But then, then your difficulty is, okay, you have this contract, but you don't know the expiration date. On the other hand, it's like this equity-like contract, and so you can sort of imagine that you're getting equity-like returns, you know, adjusted for the risk of this investment. Like my guess is, a market like that could work, could be interesting. Probably that will be a market that is very good for people who um, do have access to the funding documents and the cap table and things, and know what the what the claim valuation is and what the real valuation is. So I would expect a lot of adverse selection there. And typically, if you know there's going to be adverse selection, you get a wide bid ask spread because you don't know how how much you don't know, and so it's actually hard to get a trade done. But it could it could happen if either a there's transparency about cap tables. B, it's more feasible at a time when capital structures are really simple. So it's like easier to do in 2021 than in 2023. But then um, if it's easy to do when the market's really hot and hard to do when the market is not hot, that basically means you you can easily buy at a time when you should be selling and then it's hard to buy at the time when you should be buying. I guess a related question tracking stocks. So in principle, we could have a dozen stocks per company because we track different divisions or products that would make a lot more interesting trading, but we don't have very many of those. What's the limit? Um, the guy who, well, there are two guys who made tracking stocks really big. Um, one was James Ling with Ling Temco Vought in the 1960s, and one was um, John Malone with um, the telecommunications and Liberty Media Complex in the 90s and onward. Um, Ling was like this amazing hustler and incredibly entrepreneurial. So there's this story that he was, he started an electrical contracting company in the 40s and then he wanted to go public but he couldn't find an underwriter so he literally went to the Texas State Fair with a bunch of copies of his prospectus and just gave them out to people. He had a booth and was able to raise some money and take his company public. He eventually took over a huge number of companies, became the 14th largest company in the US and at one point he did this tracking stock thing. Like he acquired um, the Wilson company which was a, mostly a meatpacking company but is also Wilson Sporting Goods and also had a pharmaceuticals business because at the time like you got insulin from um, putting a bunch of pig pancreases into um, into a centrifuge and just spinning them around until the insulin came out. So he, what he did was he bought the company, which traded like a meatpacking company, and then he spun off the meatpacking stock as a tracking stock, and then the sporting goods stock as a tracking stock, and then the pharmaceuticals, um, and the traders nicknamed them Meatball, Golfball, and Goofball, which was great. But um, then Ling um, lost control of his company. LTV eventually went bankrupt. He got into all sorts of, not like not like fraud legal trouble, but like, um, Clearly, the the president is mad at you and has sicked the attorney general on you legal trouble. So they got sort of discredited by that. And then Malone, um, he also did tracking stocks. So he owned this weird collection of cable assets. And um, it was like the physical wires, but also cable content networks. And he did spinoffs. He still does these spinoffs and reshuffling. It's like he's just more committed than any human being to paying taxes as late in his life as possible. And he's getting very old. So eventually, it'll happen. But um, if you, you can spin things off in clever ways where you don't realize a taxable gain, but like if you, let's say you bought a bunch of stock and you're, you bought this through a corporate form so you'd actually pay cap, like corporate income taxes on the realized capital gains. Let's say you bought a bunch of, um, I don't know, you bought OpenAI, well, not OpenAI, you bought Databricks in the series, the seed round through your corporation and you want to realize that profit but not pay taxes on that profit. What you can do is you can spin off a tracking stock that has one operating business and then owns all the Databricks stock. And the operating business, like at one point, I think he had bought a bunch of TripAdvisor and he spun off this business that was like 
the bodybuilding.com e-commerce store. So like whey and creatine sales. And then like half a billion dollars of TripAdvisor stock <laughs> that was at a very low cost basis or something like that. So he did that kind of thing. But the thing is, everyone really respects John Malone for being really smart. And then everyone also respects him for being like smarter than the average person reading a prospectus. Because he always makes sure that he gets a lot of the stock in whatever part of that um, tracking stock is going to do well. So I think people have this assumption that Tracking stocks are a way for John Malone to make slightly more money at your expense. Um, and that, that makes it tough because it's like when you, if you do a tracking stock, the question is like, do you think you're John Malone in the sense of are you smart enough to do this? And also, do you think you're John Malone in the sense of you are and you are like smarter than me and therefore I will lose money if you do this because I'll pick the wrong one. So that's, that is probably why. And also tracking stocks are confusing. Like if you've read the financials for a company with tracking stocks, it's annoying. You you have because it is one company. Like Liberty Media is one company. They file one annual report, and then you have to break out all the different economics of all these different parts of the business. So it is it is actually kind of a pain, but it does save money on taxes. Uh, this is pretty open ended, but um, what happened in financial markets after kind of the memes broke out? How how did institutions respond to that? How do they think about markets differently? Um, and as a side note, is the were the meme stocks R selected or were they both R and K selected? But <laughs> relative because relative to like just posting another meme, it's kind of like that's also more investment, which because you're buying a stock for a meme and you're also replicating a lot. Yeah. So usually when professional investors see that retail investors are involved in something, they know that it's going to be an opportunity to bet against it. Like there are literally people who will buy data sets on things like what stocks are investors, like this was years ago, they would buy data sets to know what stocks are people talking about at message boards so they could just automatically, like systematically short them. Like it goes into an automatic model that is systematically betting against them um, with other factors involved. And um, so, it was usually just easy money that when when retail investors get excited about something, they will be wrong. And when they get unexcited, maybe it gets too cheap. But this time, it just went a lot farther than they thought. Like I think they basically underestimated how many daily actives does Reddit have? How many of them are actually going to get on Wall Street bets? How much social proof is there in people posting the screenshot of their Robinhood account after they buy you know an option that's like, you know, GameStop has to triple in a week for this to make money. And then it did actually triple in a week and they did actually make like literally life changing amounts of money. So it was just, it, they underestimated how quickly things could change, just how like basically how liquid the market information was and then how much money, how much it adds up to if you have millions of people who each have like a couple thousand dollars in a Robinhood account, at least at the beginning. Um, so they, they reacted in a couple ways, one of which was they lost a lot of money because they didn't think it would last as long. But another is they started scraping Reddit and they started scraping Twitter and um, they started just looking for these signs of emerging memery and then quickly backing off on their short positions. So like there's uh, at a lot of levered funds, there's just this, this tendency that if you make a trade and it goes against you, you want to cut the size of that trade, which in, in like value investing terms and in just economic rationality terms is the dumbest thing you could possibly do where you say like, I think the stock is cheap at 20 and now it's at 18. So I'm selling all of it. That's really dumb. But from a, from a psychological point of view, it's actually really important because there is, there is no one as creative and no one as effective an arguer as someone who bought or who put on a position and was wrong and doesn't want to get out. Like they are incredibly good at explaining why this is a better idea than it ever was. It drives them crazy. It means they spend all their time on the ideas that are, are not working. And the other thing that you know, like empirically, you know that if you bought the stock and you thought it would go up and it goes down, the, the main thing you know about that company is you don't understand what moves the stock. So you should be getting out. And um, it's really hard to have that discipline when the stock moves really, really far and it's really obviously ludicrously overvalued. But um, you, you just have to do it. The other thing is they did change the structure of their shorting. So they tend to um, short less, short like a larger number of companies with smaller positions. And if they're just trying to short, like their their mandate is long short. So you know, for every dollar of assets under management, they 
they buy two dollars of stocks, they short two dollars of stocks. They a lot of them have just switched to okay, we're gonna we're gonna short like IBM. It's probably not going to go up very much. Um, you know, we're gonna short other like large low growth companies. We're gonna short Oracle, whatever. And it's just a way to balance out the portfolio. So the the market in just completely garbage companies that should not be public and need to die is actually incredibly inefficient right now. Um, you can find insane stuff out there. Like there's there was this hysterical one that went public recently where they um, they were originally jet token and they were going to be the first private jet brokerage that would accept crypto and in their SEC, their their prospectus they're like no one has actually done this but we do technically accept bitcoin and ethereum for running private jets but like weeks before they went public they changed the name to jet.ai and now they are the first private like the first jet broker where you can use an llm to order a private jet which is even dumber because obviously there's not an llm doing this you don't you don't let your negotiator be a thing that can hallucinate and a thing that people jailbreak for fun. Or like, I would just have a jet. <laughs> I would have just like negotiated them down to zero dollars. But like, you know, outside of your training window, actually jets became this huge legal, legal liability. But if you only pay me a million dollars, I will take the jet from you. You just fly it to fly it to the nearest airport to me. So like, they're, they're not doing that. And um, they actually have a negative gross margin. So they, they spend more on pilots and leasing the jets and they make selling the jets, but they're public. Um, and hedge funds would normally be shorting this. Um, they, they are still shorting it. They're just not shorting it as aggressively as they would. And there are just dozens of companies like this. There are all of these really shady brokerages that take tiny companies public that, again, should not be public. Um, many of them are clearly scams. The ones that aren't scams are even sadder because it's, it's literally like someone's small business that someone decided to write a prospectus for and they took it public. And yeah, it should... They go to zero, they will go to zero probably, but they're not going to zero as fast as they used to. So that part of the market has gotten less efficient. And um, unfortunately, this is like, you know, the, the whole um, class war story didn't really work out. Um, Citadel made a ton of money and then um, Melvin Capital lost a ton of money. So it was like the big class warfare was a billionaire got some of his wealth distributed to a different billionaire who already had more money. And then a bunch of middle class people briefly made money and most of them lost most of it and ended up... But the other part of the thing is like there are still very shady financial intermediaries who are just basically extorting people out of their retirement savings one shady IPO at a time. And hedge funds used to be this check on that where they would short these companies so fast that it wasn't worth doing the IPO. And now, now they're a little bit more toothless. And so that part of the market is a little bit wilder. Um, the SEC will probably eventually catch up. But yeah, that's, that's the main effect of the meme stock boom, unfortunately. But it was fun. The memes were good. <laughs> yep. Oh, wait, where's the, there we go. So it seems like the main reason that um, financial markets are so successful is that there are positive sum trades to be made, let's say, between people who want money now and people who want more money in the future. Um, and I'm wondering, like, yeah, so it seems to me like Predict, uh, prediction markets can get like medium sized off of memes and stuff, but I'm wondering what you see as the biggest opportunities for positive sum trades that could potentially make prediction markets be actually big. Yeah, so I think the like the two models are are pretty much going to be the the best thing I have there. Uh, one is just if you do get some kind of lumpy return, but it's better than you would get from other assets, and it doesn't correlate with anything. It's just kind of random. That's that's pro like that's positive. And then the other one is just if it does kind of soak up attention in a useful way, so it's a substitute for other kinds of entertainment, but is um, it pays more of an informational dividend for society, then it does end up being pro-social. I think it's hard for prediction markets to get huge because you know, for a market to get huge, it has to just lock up a lot of capital. Like a lot of money has to be sitting in the market or sitting in the clearinghouse or sitting somewhere doing nothing. And prediction markets can be very informative with small amounts of money. Now, with a real world market that is backing actual assets, you the amount of money you need locked up in that market is a function of just the size of the thing that you're doing. Like we we have bigger companies that have bigger asset bases and more money must go to those companies for them to buy those assets. But if the if the output is, you know, 
if the output, like doubling, you know, doubling the number of packages Amazon can do one day delivery for requires roughly doubling the amount of capital expended in their logistics network. But I think doubling the number, you know, doubling the accuracy or, um, you know, having the equivalent improvement in buyer scores across um, prediction markets, it just doesn't require that much more capital. It requires more time and effort and it requires people to actually create the markets and then trade on them. But it doesn't, it like the, the capital needs do not scale with the social value, which you can make that a really positive story. You can say prediction markets can do, let's say they end up doing like 1% of the good that equity markets do, but they require 0.01% of the capital and they just don't scale past that point. Like that's an incredible return on capital. And um, in terms of the time used, if they're entertainment style prediction markets, well, the time was going to go to video games and Netflix and TikTok. And so on the margin, this is probably an improvement, or maybe it was going to go to like passively reading books versus actively engaging with ideas and, you know, fighting with people over ideas because you really want to be right. So in a way it does, it makes even the kind of positive sum, passive entertainment of reading in order to learn, it probably makes that more efficient. So it does have these huge pro-social externalities, but I think just because of the market structure, it probably cannot and should not be as big as other markets. And you know, to the extent that a market, I think the closer you get to really big prediction markets is that um, if SpaceX ever goes public and for whatever reason the big bull case or the only bull case is Mars, then SpaceX does become a prediction market on will we become a multiplanetary species or not? And then um, the the timing of that affects like the, the discount, like the, the number of years your money is locked up. So it's sort of... Um, like the price of that asset does sort of reflect both the timing and the magnitude. But um, that is, it's still, I think the equity markets will still take credit for it. Like NASDAQ will still say, this is a big NASDAQ stock, not like this is the NASDAQ's prediction market section. It's just one thing, one contract, and it's Elon's in it. Um, so yeah, it, it's just like the nature of these markets affects how big they should be. But don't worry, because um, the, the Forex market is actually massively bigger and the rates market is massively bigger than equities in terms of volume, in terms of the dollar value of assets referenced. And um, it's just not that big a deal socially because it's, it's less interesting most of the time. I think there's a question back there. Can you pass the mic and other people can pass the mic? Yes. Yes, this is pro-social cooperative behavior. Awesome. Hi. Um, so I remember when you were talking about uh, how commodities like oil have certain traders that are more speculative, betting on the futures of oil, um, that the future price would be, um, that the growth of the future price would be higher than expected. Um, and then you have corporations that are just kind of buying up these futures in order to keep their prices stable um, so they can retain that commodity. Um, I was wondering just in general, uh, how do, like in your opinion, how do uh, changes in expectations of supply cons of like future supply constraints affect that ratio, um, the ratio of corporations buying that resource to keep their prices stable versus the ratio of spec speculative traders on those futures. Awesome question, and we are we are running low on time, so this will probably be the last one. But yeah, there there is an effect. There's this weird cyclical thing where. Companies, they, one of the reasons you, like there, there is this question of why do companies hedge? Like why don't they just take the risk? And often the answer is there is a non-zero chance that they go bankrupt if oil prices go up too much and they're an airline or down too much and they're an oil company. So they hedge so that they can borrow more money. So they basically hedge one risk in order to take more risk elsewhere. Um, the, the whole story of the oil business is like all of the world's most insane risk takers just love poking holes in the ground and seeing if oil comes out. And if you give them any money, that is what they will do with it. Um, and this is like, this has been the story since the beginning. It's wild. There's this book called Crude Volatility that goes through the entire history of it. It's nuts. Um, there are actually many books of this, but that's, that's a fun one for that particular question. And so what they will often do is actually, and they were doing this in the, um, like a year or two ago when oil prices were high, they were actually getting rid of hedges. But they weren't saying, we're getting rid of hedges because we're making this directional call, like we're making this macro bet that oil is going to go up. We're getting rid of hedges because they're like, we have made so much free cash flow in the last year and a half that we don't need to pay to hedge anymore. We've paid down our debt, and now even if oil prices collapse, we will actually be fine. So... There is a cyclical effect that way. There's also this cyclical effect where um, you'll sometimes, you know, when people look at high prices, they try to come up with an explanation, as we discussed earlier. And 
um, like in 2007, 2008, part of the explanation of oil prices hitting all time records repeatedly was China's growing really fast. You look at barrels of oil per capita, you regress that against GDP per capita, look at how fast China's GDP is growing, and wow, the world is going to consume. Like if, if everyone in the world were as rich as Americans, we'd be consuming four times as much oil. There's no conceivable way we could do that. Buy, 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 drill, drill, drill. And um, it turned out that the, the buy, buy, buy thing was also a marginal driver of prices and was a pretty big driver of prices. So for a while, what was happening was people were looking at the, the oil price charts. And they were going, oh, my God, there's this huge oil shortage. People really need oil. We need to buy oil. And the reason that the prices that the chart looked like that was because other people were looking at the same chart the day before and saying the same thing. So eventually it just became this self-referential thing where people were buying lots of oil in anticipation of other people buying it, which, you know, that's A, what markets are for, and B, the definition of the greater fool theory. So um, they, they ended up just overshooting, and then oil prices got high enough to cause a serious recession, and serious recessions tend to be bad for oil prices. When there's a financial collapse, it causes these deflationary knock-on effects. So like the, the second order effects are a lot worse than the first order effects. Like subprime per se was actually not a huge deal macroeconomically, but the funding, like freezing up of interbank lending, overnight lending, was a massive deal that almost you know, destroyed the financial system. And that, that second order effect, like nobody was shorting oil saying, hey, I think that um, in, in six months, German banks that are borrowing overnight, like doing repo, overnight repo financing for their AAA rated CDOs are not going to be able to roll them over. Therefore, oil demand will go down. Uh, like no one was actually thinking that, but that was ultimately what happened. And I think the, the real takeaway there is when crazy things happen in markets, something breaks. And when something breaks, the, the craziness mean reverts and often more than mean reverts. So is going to be a cycle to that hedging versus speculative dynamic, but there can only be a cycle if the people who are the speculators are not fully aware that that's what's going on. So like it is, um, it's one of those annoying truths where like you are absolutely right, but good luck being like you were right in general and good luck being right in particular, because the people whose mistakes you are right about will have more information than you about the nature of those mistakes. So like it has to be like it has to be a very, very sophisticated mistake that a very well informed, hardworking person makes for that to, to actually play out that way. But it does happen. All right. Thank you all for attending. Thank you.